This week, we're going to be talking about contentment. And so if you'll join me in prayer as we pray over this sermon. Lord, we just ask you to guide our minds and our thoughts this morning as we approach one of the most important subjects uh, in the Bible, and it deals with contentment. God, I pray that you'll remove our distractions, uh, you'll remove uh, our thoughts that are keeping us from focusing on your word and understanding what it is that you want us to do and say and be and think. God, we thank you for this opportunity that we get a chance to come together uh, and to serve and worship and uh, pay our respects to you, Father, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, I pray everyone in this room will be blessed and that their minds will be provoked and their hearts will be moved and their lives will be changed for the sake of your glory. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a movie that I uh, watched a few times as a kid, uh, Jerry Maguire. Anybody ever watch Jerry Maguire? You know what I'm talking about, right? And uh, it, was, it was a pretty good movie, and obviously everybody, as soon as you hear that, that, uh, that name pops into your mind, you think of probably one of the most epic scenes in romantic comedies, right? Uh, Jerry, he is somebody that is his sports agent, and basically he sends this memo around his church, uh, around his church, wow, he sends this memo around his office, and he gets fired for it. I mean, he is making hundreds of thousands of dollars. He has signed some of the top athletes. And, and so he, he sends this memo around because he has a conviction of his conscience. He gets fired. And so he leaves and he asks, who's going with me? He decides to leave and he wants to know who's going to go with him. And nobody responds. And he asks it a couple times, and still nobody responds. And finally, there's this single mom that's working in the office, and she stands up, and she decides to go with Jerry as they start their own business, trying to recruit uh, people who play professional football uh, so that they can be their sports agent. And throughout this whole romantic comedy, basically, Jerry Maguire ends up falling in love with her. And he doesn't even realize it. And so here's this wonderful woman. Uh, like I said, she's a single mom. She has a son. And, and Jerry falls for her. And so they're sitting around this dinner table. And Jerry comes in the room. And, and a lot of you already know, right? And if you haven't seen this part, shame on you because you're missing out on life. And so it's so cheesy. It's so terrible. And he's looking at her. And he's saying, I love you. You complete me. And he goes on to express his love for her. And in the midst, she goes, just shut up. Just shut up. What's the next phrase? You had me at hello, right? But is that true? I mean, I think in a sense, we have bought into this lie that we can find somebody in life that actually completes us. And if we can't find someone in our life that makes us feel complete and satisfied, we can find something in our life that makes us feel complete and satisfied. And it comes with this idea, especially in our culture, that the more that you have, the happier that you'll feel. Have you ever fallen uh, into that trap, into that lie? That if I could just get more of X, whatever X is, I will finally be happy. If I could just have a better job, if I could have a better outfit, a wardrobe, if I could have a better house, a better car, if I could just have more money, more time, if I could just have more... I will finally be happy. And the same thing can carry over into our relationships. And it is a lie of Satan that if my spouse would just be different, I would finally be happy. Or maybe even this, if I could just have somebody different, they would fulfill my dreams and I would finally be happy. This morning, as I said, we're going to be talking about what it means to be content. And I like what King Solomon said. King Solomon had everything you could ever imagine. He was arguably one of the richest men that has ever lived in the face of this earth, in the history of our time. He had as many women, as much money. He had this incredibly beautiful palace. I mean, the guy had everything at his fingertips. And Solomon wrote this. He said, all things are wearisome. More than one can say, the eye never has enough of seeing, and the ear has, never has its fill of hearing. In other words, we get caught up in this cycle of just wanting more. And one of the greatest enemies to the Christian faith is being discontent. If the enemy being Satan, or even if yourself, can drive you to the point where you always want more, if you allow the culture to tell you this self-entitled, egocentric lie that your happiness is what matters the most, if you can buy into that lie, it can actually destroy your Christianity from the roots up. It defiles it. It corrupts it. 
And so I'd like to tell you a little bit more about what it means to be content. You know, the Stoic philosophers of old, uh, people like Aristotle and Plato, they believed this. They believed that in order to attain uh, contentment, in order to truly be content, you had to accomplish this inner peace. And it was an inner peace that was cultivated by wisdom and experience. And so in other words, whatever situation you found yourself in, you could truly be content by your own inner resources, right? What you have been able to accomplish in and of, your, in and of itself. So whether you're rich or poor, whether you have a lot or have a little, whether you're living in a palace or in a prison, your peace, your contentment comes through your own inner resources. That's what they used to believe. Well, the Apostle Paul comes along, and Jesus, and he revolutionizes the idea of what it means to be content. It's no longer to be dependent upon yourself and your own inner resources. No, for the Christian, what it truly needs to be content is to be totally dependent upon Jesus Christ upon God himself. That's how you attain uh, attain true contentment in this life. And so we have to rid ourselves of this idea that we can gain contentment by our own self. No, we can only learn contentment through our understanding of who God is and having a relationship with him. The Apostle Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. He says, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Can you say that of yourself? I mean, think about it. Has there ever been a point in time in your life where you have been completely content, never wanting more? Maybe as a child, right, when you were ignorant of what everyone else had. Uh, But even then, you see what someone else has and you say, I want that. And so you burn and you lust after it. And like I said, our culture is saturated with this idea of always wanting more. But yet the Apostle Paul says, I have learned to be content. And he goes on, if you read that passage of scripture, he goes on to say, look, whether I've got a lot or a little, whether I've got clothes or no clothes, whether I'm hungry or full, I have learned to be content. And that is something that we should all strive for. Because when it comes to our relationships, as I said, one of the biggest enemies of your happiness is learning to be content with who you have. Or if you're not in a relationship, maybe you're single, uh, maybe you haven't been married yet, or maybe you're even divorced. One of the biggest enemies of you finding happiness in this life is thinking that I've got to find someone like Jerry Maguire who will finally complete me. God wants us to be content. He wants us to be happy. The way the Bible defines contentment is simply this, to be satisfied, to have enough, to be sufficient. When it's used as an adjective to describe oneself, it means to be in need of no assistance. It means to have satisfaction with what you have. And so if we can think of contentment as a state of being, it is a state of being that you yourself choose to be in. It's by your own choice that you can be content. It's not a one-time feeling. Uh, It's not a momentary uh, emotion. But it is a state of being that no matter what circumstance you find yourself in, whether you're married or single, whether you feel like you have a good marriage or not, whether your spouse meets all of your expectations, you are still content. You are still happy. Another way to think of it is like this. As we define this word to be content, is to think of its opposite right? Think about the opposite of what it means to be content. And one of the words that pops into my mind is covetness, to covet. And basically, this is actually listed in one of the Ten Commandments, thou shall not covet. And it goes on to further explain in the Old Testament what you shouldn't covet. And it lists uh, a person, uh, the spouse, right? A neighbor's husband or wife. It says, thou shall not covet their things, their money, what they have. Thou shall not covet their property, And so the Bible really over and over again warns us about falling into this trap, about having a deep desire or a deep lust after things that we do not have. And so we need to be on guard. If you can think of it like this, to covet is to have a lust, a burning passion, a deep desire that goes beyond its intended bounds. There is nothing wrong with wanting compatibility. There is nothing wrong with wanting a better job or actually wanting materials or possessions. The problem happens when it goes beyond its intended boundaries, that deep yearning and that deep desire, and we get trapped into sin. And this is especially true in relationships, right, husbands and wives. When you start being dissatisfied with who you're married to, and you start looking at all your spouse's flaws and imperfections, and you start seeing posts on social media, or you start reminiscing about the past, and you're saying, man, if only they would be different, or if only I could have somebody different, I would finally be happy. Well, that's the sin of covetousness. 
Desiring what you do not have. Desiring what other people have. And we can all fall into this trap. And so if you can think of it like this, I watched this movie called Wall Street Money Never Sleeps. And it's basically about the, the game, the rat race of acquiring more. And one of the characters in the story, his name is Jake Moore. He's the main character. And he is uh, in a relationship and going to be married to this girl whose father was basically a wolf of Wall Street. I mean, the guy was a savage, and he had just got uh, put in prison. He had, he had served his pre- a prison sentence. And there was a lot of scandal that was going on. And so Jake is talking to uh, this tyrant of Wall Street. And in, and in the story, his name is, is Bretton James. And so he asks him, he says, he says this, What is your number? The amount of money that you would need to walk away from it and just live. What is your number? And Britton James, he pauses, and he has this really creepy, evil smile that comes across his face, and he says, more. That's my number, more. I just want more. And so you can see why coveting could be a root of all sin. It's the selfish desire to attain more for yourself, and it will lead you to do unspeakable things in order to achieve that. Here's what James says about falling into this trap. In James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, James writes this, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lusts. The desire to want more, to have more, to want what other people have. He says, then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. It brings forth death. I think our internet has been one of the greatest blessings and the greatest curses that has ever happened to our people, our our time, our culture. In a sense, it's been a great blessing because it's given us the opportunity to access more information than we could ever imagine. The average person could read and learn from some of the greatest theologians and philosophers that our world has ever seen, right? But at the same time, the internet has given us access to more sinful things than we could ever conceive or imagine. I mean, pornography being just one of them. Well, one of the greatest deceptions of social media has to do uh, with, with the, the internet has to do with our social media. I have seen, personally, Facebook ruin more marriages and relationships than I would care to, to count. Because what people have done is they've grown discontent in their relationships, and, the, and so they seek out people from the past, right? They reminisce of the days of old, and they... they friend them on Facebook and they find compatibility and their reputation is ruined or their marriage is ruined because they've decided to click on discontent, to send that Facebook message, to express that inner feeling of discontent, rather than actually going to your spouse and spending time with him or her and working on your marriage, Facebook has corrupted our relationships with one another. Not only has it preached to us this horrible lie. I mean, how many people honestly get on there and just post selfies of them when they first woke up and haven't even brushed their teeth, (laughs) right? Nobody does that. Everyone wants to share when they're at their best, when they look great. You have absolutely no idea what they've grown to be or what they're like behind closed doors, but we buy into this lie that, wow, look at how happy they are. And even, even in this sense, right, not even just relationships, but we look at people's posts on Instagram or Twitter, and we see this fabulous life of all the things that they have, of themselves when they're totally done up in makeup, or when they're working out at the gym and their muscles are all bulging like this up on the stage, you know what I mean? That's why I wear jackets, because I don't want to be boastful and show you my guns, you know what I mean? The truth is, I haven't been to the gym in six months. <laughs> Got to cover it up, you know what I mean? But that's the truth. I mean, that is the reality, is that Facebook has been a great tool for connecting with people, but it's also been a great enemy because it leads people into temptation. And so we can buy into this Jerry Maguire lie that this other person can complete us, and only if we have their relationship, or only if we were married and connected with them, that would we finally be happy. And this compounds with the lie that God's purpose in this life is to make you happy. We believe that lie, and we accept that lie, and that's just simply not true. Does God want you to be happy? Definitely. Will you be happy at some point in time in your life? I hope so. But you could actually live a horribly miserable life and never really be happy materialistically. But that's not the point. That's not why God loves you. That's not why God created you. It's not to be happy, but it's to be holy and in a relationship with him. And sometimes that comes at a great cost of your own personal happiness. If you think your spouse is meant to complete you and fulfill you as a person, you're going to end up a very unhappy person. 
There is no possible way that your spouse can achieve or sustain that idolization in your own mind. It simply cannot happen. And that's one of the problems that we have, especially in our younger marriages, as we enter this marriage, this covenant relationship, believing the lie that this person is going to fulfill my every want and my every desire, and I'll finally be happy. And we get into a relationship with them, and you find out your husband complains to you about how you fold the towels. You're like, who did I marry? You get that if you were here last week, right? And this is the truth. If you think that your future spouse, for those of you who are unmarried, or maybe you're divorced, if you think that your future spouse is going to complete you, and all you have to do is to find them, you'll, and, and you'll be happy, you are in for a devastating experience. There is no doubt about that. And so I ask you, where do you find yourself this morning? Are you a person who is content, or do you find yourself getting caught up in this lie, if only I could have more, I would finally be happy? Some of the ancients, like Socrates, for instance, they had this idea that contentment was a very honorable virtue. It's what they all sought to attain. I mean, think about it. The idea that you could finally be happy and be at peace regardless of your situation, isn't that what we all want, just to be happy? Socrates said this, he is richest who is content with the least. I think that's true. If you can learn to be content with basically nothing, You're always going to be content. You're always going to be satisfied and fulfilled. George Eliot wrote this, The contented man is never poor, and the discontented man is never rich. And that's absolutely true. If you're discontent, you're always going to want more. And I think that this is so obvious. It is so true that you are not poor until you want what you do not have. You don't find yourself at a disadvantage in a relationship until you start seeking things that you don't have in your relationship. When you start focusing on what you don't have, rather than counting the blessings for what you do have, your heart becomes in turmoil, and you're completely dissatisfied with the other person, and maybe even yourself. And so how do you know if you're living in discontentment? I've got four identifiers that I'd like to share with you this morning about how to know if you're living in discontent. Here's the first one. You're in constant misery. If you are discontent with who you have or who you will have or who you are, you will always find something to be miserable about. Proverbs 15, 15 says this, All the days of the afflicted are bad, but a cheerful heart has a continual feast. If you are miserable and you are discontent, you will always find something to be upset about in the other person. Look, If you are married, you have married an imperfect person. And I can guarantee you, they are going to do something wrong every single day of their life. And if you want to find something wrong, you are going to find something wrong. If you want to find something wrong with our church, it's going to happen, right? It's just reality. And so the person who is always afflicted, their their days are always going to be bad, the Bible says. And so one of the worst things that you can do in a marriage relationship or even a dating relationship is to always find the bad in a person, to always be distracted by what you don't like and how they fail rather than being thankful for what you have. When I meet couples who are ready to be divorced or they're having a really bad time, I, it almost sometimes seems like they are like enemies, right? We're talking about love and war, and they are definitely at war. They are not happy with each other. You would think that they actually hate each other and they're enemies. And so sitting in my office, and we'll talk, and they'll share what they don't like about each other. And so I'll bring this up. I'll reminisce of the past, and I'll say, well, what brought you together? What were some of the things that you you liked about each other and that you cherished about each other? And you can kind of see that subtle shift, that they start recognizing and remembering what it was about the other person that first caused them to fall in love, so to speak, and what they really appreciated and valued about the other individual. And if we get caught up in always being dissatisfied with the other person and failing to be thankful and recognize the good, of course our relationships are going to end in divorce and separation because you're never going to be happy. And if you're a discontented person who's believed that lie, the chief of all life is to make you happy. And so all your decisions are based off of your personal happiness rather than the holiness that we have with God. And so we have to find a way to be happy. And if you find that yourself uh, have complained every day or every other day, you are somebody who is living in discontent. You know why the grass is greener on the other side? It's because the other side waters their grass. And if all you ever do is sit on the fence and you look at the greener grass and you watch how beautiful it is and you never pay attention to your own grass, 
Of course yours is going to die and be brown. Go over there and start watering your own grass, in other words, right? Pay attention to what you do have. Be thankful for it. Care for it. Fight for it. Make it healthy. Make it better. We should spend more time, if we're single, investing in ourselves, focusing on becoming the right person rather than finding the person uh, that would make us right. Or if we are married, we should be more focusing on our own spouses rather than what other people have. That's number one, constant misery. Number two is constant exhaustion. You will wear yourself out trying to become something that you're not, right? Husbands, if you try to fix your wives, good luck. (laughs) Wives, if you try to fix your husbands, good luck. There's only one person who can transform your spouse the way that you want him to, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so if you're not constantly reminding your spouse and pointing them to the cross, right, rather than this false idolization that you have in your own mind, you are going to be exhausted, The Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 4. Do not wear yourself out trying to get rich. Do not trust in your own cleverness. Angel and I, you know one of our favorite things to do is? Nothing. (laughs) Absolutely nothing, right? We love to just hang out together. We'll play board games together. We'll watch a movie together. We are just so happy being in our own home. I love wearing my PJs. In fact, sometimes I wear PJs to the office when I don't have any meetings, right? I love it. I love just sitting around and just being with angels. It's one of our favorite things to do. But every once in a while, we'll get caught up, and we'll see what other people were doing. We're like, man, that looks really fun. They're traveling. They're going on trips. They're going out and doing really fun stuff. And so we'll fall into that trap, and we'll believe, man, if we just go out and do this, we'll, we'll, we'll be happier, right? And we go out and do it, and we're miserable, and we're exhausted, Have you ever felt like that? I'll give you an example. Angel and I wanted to take a cruise, the first and only cruise we've ever been on in our life. Looks pretty fun, right? Looks pretty fun until everyone is a crazy person getting drunk on the cruise, until everything is dirty and nasty and gross and your wife is sitting in the room and won't come out because she's sick and throwing up because the boat is going like this. (laughs) I mean, it was miserable. And we had to spend like three days in misery because we bought into the lie that what other people do is fun, right? Right? Go into an amusement park, take a vacation, congratulations, you're going to be exhausted walking around and riding rides because look at all the fun that everyone's having. Don't get me wrong, I I love amusement parks, okay? It's absolutely fun. But the proverb is simply this. When we read between the lines, it's teaching us, don't wear yourself out by your own wisdom trying to accumulate what you don't already have. Enjoy the person that you're with. Enjoy the spouse that you have. If you're single or you're divorced, enjoy who you are in the image of God. And anything else that you get is a bonus that you'll be happy about and content. So first of all, you're miserable. Second of all, you're exhausted. Third of all, you constantly spend. You constantly spend. Think about it like this. If you have a bigger house, you've got larger bills. If you have a nicer car, the repairs are more expensive. If you get a better job and you make more money, the government will what? Take more of it. So what's the point of killing your relationship for all of these things that you can enjoy that you're going to end up giving away to other people? Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 11 says this, As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? Ooh, look at all the really nice stuff that I can have that I can't enjoy. Isn't that great? If we start calculating what we spend our money and time on uh, in the sense of our time, I think that will bring a lot more relevancy to our life and to our decisions. Should I get this thing to sacrifice five hours with my family? That kind of puts it in perspective, doesn't it? And so if you as a spouse or you as a couple or even you as an individual wear yourself out and spend everything that you've accumulated and you don't actually get to enjoy it with other people, you've kind of missed the point. It's like celebrities, for instance, right? Ooh, really cool, you know, they're awesome. They make millions of dollars a year, and then they buy $300 pair of jeans like this up on the screen. Look at this. These jeans, I got two pair of them sitting at home. (laughs) I could be a millionaire. Look at these jeans. They got mud and dirt all over them. What kind of insane individual would buy these kind of jeans for 300 bucks? I'll tell you who, the ones who are trying to fit in with everyone else right? The ones who are trying to keep up with the Kardashians. 
you got to have all the nice stuff. I saw a picture of Kanye West. He looked like he had absolutely no money whatsoever. <laughs> he had rips in his clothes. He's wearing like this really big baggy shirt. And I'm like, man, what happened to this dude? Did he go bankrupt? Oh, no, that's fashion now. Yeah, that makes sense. Dude, you look horrible. <laughs> but you got to keep up with the Kardashians, right? you got to buy all of this really expensive stuff to fit in. And couples can totally buy into this lie. If we finally just get more, we will be happy. And so you spend everything that you have, and you forget to enjoy spending time with each other. For instance, this jacket that I have, $6 at Goodwill, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) Seriously, I bought it this weekend. It was awesome. It's probably like a $100, $200 jacket that some sucker bought at retail. (sighs) Not me anymore, buddy. Goodwill, that's what I'm talking about. I love Goodwill now. You know what I mean? It's awesome. <laughs> it's like I walk in, there's like brand new Under Armour stuff, and I'm like, man, what have I been doing all my life? <laughs> missing out, man. You guys are missing out. And I'm, t- I'm not telling you which Goodwill I go to. Is this got the good stuff? Okay? It's all for me. So we will constantly spend everything we got. Here's number four, constant worry. Do you know what's great about overcomplicating your relationship? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Worrying about the other person, I mean, it'll keep you up at night. You'll lose your own sleep. And so I think about this. If we spend all of our time trying to gain all of this stuff so that other people will fall in love with us and other people will love us more, if we would just buy them more gifts and do nice things for them and get them to love us based off of what we have rather than who we are, we are in for a very unhappy ending in our relationship. And here's the deal. Couples who work on their relationship, they don't worry too much. Why? Because they're investing in the other person. They're not investing in things or materials. They are happy with each other, whether they have a little or whether they have a lot. They love each other. Why? Because their relationship is based off of personhood, not off of property and things that you can accumulate. And so if we are going to have a happy, content relationship with each other, if we are going to be a content person in and of ourselves, we've got to rid ourselves of this idea that we just need to get more. One of my favorite movies that I watched as a a, a young guy, I watched it throughout my teenage years as well, was Coming to America. You ever seen Coming to America with Eddie Murphy? Yeah, shame on you if you haven't, because it is awesome. And Eddie Murphy is basically this prince from Africa, and he wants to come to America to find a wife for himself, right? Right? But in order to accomplish that process, he takes off all of his gold. In fact, most of it gets stolen the moment he enters New York. It's pretty funny. It's a great scene. He rents out this really disgusting, uh, crappy apartment. It's got rats, and it's dirty, and it's gross. Uh, he, he gets a job as a janitor at McDonald's, making, like, really low income. Back, I mean, back in that day, a minimum wage was, like, six bucks an hour, five bucks, five fifty an hour, I think. And so he basically wanted to find compatibility, and he wanted someone to love him for who he was, not what he had, Right? And he finds someone. She's the daughter uh, of the man who owns the McDonald's restaurant. And he has this, of course, this antagonist, this guy that he's competing against. And the guy is wealthy and he's super cool and he drives a nice car. And the father-in-law loves him because he's really rich. But yet he and this young lady find compatibility and they love each other. And she doesn't even know that, she, that he is a prince. And she loves him for who he is. And here's what's so cool. Do you think he's going to worry about whether or not his spouse is going to leave him? or cheat on him, or forsake him, whether he has a lot or a little? Absolutely not. Why? Because she married him, not what he has. And so if you are constantly worrying about the other person, do I have enough money? Do we have enough things? Have I bought her enough gifts, or him enough gifts? Do they love me for who I am? You've probably built your relationship off of something that won't last. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 12 says this, The sleep of the laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. You go out there and work, and you work hard, and you're satisfied because you're a hard worker. But if all you have is all this stuff, all you're ever doing is up worrying about it. And so the teaching of the proverb, and even though this applies specifically to money, the teaching of the proverb is simply about this. Work on what you have not on what you don't have, and you will rest a whole lot better. Your worry will be a whole lot less because you are investing in in the person, not in the things. Jesus put it like this, and who of you being worried can add a single hour to his life? 
Do not remain in the state of being discontent and just worry. Fix it. Whatever it is, whatever is broken, fix it. Spend time with one another. Get back to the basics of why you decide to marry the person in the first place and what brought you together in love. And Paul knew this all too well. As we read at the beginning, so we now, we read at the end. Contentment is something that must be learned, and it is a very hard lesson. But it is probably one of the most valuable lessons that you could ever learn, because it will truly set you free. One of the people I admire the most in history is Helen Keller, right? Most of us know Helen Keller and who she was. She was mute, she was deaf, and she was blind. What, a, what an obstacle to overcome, right? I mean, how do, you even, how do you even learn and begin that process? And she learned it all too well. She was a warrior, man, and she overcame her circumstances, and she found a way to be happy, despite being in such a terrible circumstance and situation. She wrote this, the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart, and that is true, and that's what she experienced. And so I'd like to close out today with five things that you can do in order to fight for contentment. Wage war against your discontentment. Number one is to trust in the providence of God. Do you have a lot of money right now? Do you have a little money right now? Do you have a nice house or a not so nice house? Are you married or are you not married? Trust in the providence of God. I've made mistakes in the past and I like to think that those mistakes were big enough to mess up God's plan, but that's just simply not true. What it means to trust in the providence of God is simply this. To accept your circumstances as they are and do what it takes to walk closer to God. This idea and this element of trust. I'm glad I'm going to trust you with the marriage that I have, with the circumstance that I'm in, with where you've placed me at this point in time in my life. I trust you and I wait on you. Helen Keller said this, No pessimist has ever discovered the secret of the stars, or sail to the uncharted land, or open the doorway of the human spirit, because they're so worried about what's going wrong that they fail to look up to God with what he has made right. Trust that God is in control and he knows what he's doing. That's how you become content. Second of all, be thankful. One of the greatest enemies of your contentment is to complain and to criticize, and to nag, and find a way to be upset. And so you have to counteract your discontent, your focus over what you don't have, by being thankful for what you do have. Focus on what you do have. Paul said this, rejoice, always rejoice. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, through prayer and and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And so in your prayer life, before you even start asking God, God, I want to go down through my list of everything that I don't have because you're my God and this whole deal with becoming a Christian meant that I was supposed to get everything that I wanted, right? Absolutely not. Be happy with the cross. Everything else is a bonus. Be happy with who God is. Everything else is a blessing. And so before you approach God with your list of requests, approach God with a list of things that you can be thankful for. And when you're in that moment and you can't stand that other person because they're driving you insane and all you can see is red and you're like, why did I even marry this person? Sit back and give thanks for who they are and for what you have. That's how you can be content. So trust in the providence of God. Be thankful. Helen Keller said this, keep your face to the sunshine and you cannot see its shadow. And that is so true. Focus on the good and you won't be overwhelmed with the bad. Third of all, be independent. Paul said, look, it doesn't matter the circumstance that I'm in. I have learned to be content, which means there was at one point in time which Paul was discontent, right? I mean, think about it. This guy was the Hebrew of Hebrews. He was the the top in line. He had the most power, the most wealth, the most success. I mean, the guy was a high roller, so to speak. He He was doing very well for himself and he lost it all. And it took losing it all to finally be totally dependent upon God and say, God, I am satisfied because I have you. And as he's writing the letter to the Philippians, it was 10 years later that he was put in jail. And so here is Paul 10 years later. And as he's writing this letter, the chains around his wrist are are shackling and they're ringing as the prisoner next to him watches the word that he writes. And here he is in prison saying, I am content. I am satisfied. And so Helen Keller says this, your success and happiness lies within you. Resolve to keep happy and your joy and you shall from an invincible host against difficulties. Resolve to be happy within your own self. 
Keep on to your joy. Find a way to be thankful, in other words, despite your circumstances. So trust in the providence of God. Be thankful for what you have. Be independent. Don't let your circumstances determine your satisfaction. Number four, be satisfied with a little. And this is probably the greatest challenge. I'm not going to lie. This would be my greatest challenge. This is my greatest challenge. Being satisfied with just a little. It's like only taking one bite of a donut. Do you realize how hard that is? I mean, what kind of psychopath would only take one bite? You know what I mean? Well, somebody who is content. You're not crazy. You're content. That's how I think anyways. I know that's probably bad. I shouldn't have said that. Anyways, that's what it's like. Be satisfied with just a little bit. Just a little. And then if you have a lot, you're going to be really full and really satisfied. And so we must relentlessly pursue satisfaction even with just a little bit. I was speaking with a man, uh, and we were reading the story. We read the story about somebody who hit the lottery, and it totally wrecked this person's life. And I've shared some of the stories with you before, right? Somebody hits the lottery. They end up getting killed. One person was, like, buried in cement uh, by their spouse. I mean, these people go through horror stories, right? And so one person, they lost everything after they gained all of this money, and they said, you know, I would not wish this upon anyone. Getting rich quick has really been horrible for me. And you can't help but think, may the Lord smite me over and over again. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, how could you be so miserable after hitting something like the lottery and getting all that money? Well, the reality is, is having a lot of stuff isn't necessarily the answer to all your problems. Helen Keller said this, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. Failing to see what is right before you, failing to see the big picture That's a tragedy. And so we must fight to be happy with a little, or in this case, we must fight to be happy with who we have and the time that we do have it, not what we don't have. Focus on the blessings. Be satisfied and full with what you got. And then fifthly and finally is this. Be aware of what you have. It's probably the most important. Be aware of what you have because it's temporary. Everyone in this room at one point in time is not going to be in this room. They're going to pass away. They're going to die. The person that you're married to one day won't be there. And hopefully some of you aren't sitting there thinking, amen. (laughs) Right? That would not be a good thing. (laughs) Right? Temporary is like, look. (laughs) I know, it's really bad. Right? Temporary. We've got to have this perception. We've got to be aware that we only have a little time with each other. It is a vapor. Life is a vapor. And who we have, and let's be honest, look, I've been there. When you are complaining about the short amount of things that you have and you fail to recognize the blessing that they are in your life, it is a great tragedy. It is a great tragedy. So be aware that you only have a little bit that could vanish today. James chapter 4 verse 14 says this, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Be thankful for what you have because it could disappear tomorrow. Be thankful for who you are because you could disappear tomorrow. Helen Keller said this, walking with a friend in the dark is better than walking alone in the light. And that is so very true. Find a way to be thankful. Fight for contentment. I'd like to end with this story. I, uh, in my street, I live next to a family. You can tell they've been there for a while because they've kind of accumulated several houses on the block. And uh, this guy that I, I live next to, uh, he's married and he has some type of disability. Uh, he got in, a, in an accident. I believe it was a, a drinking and driving accident. I'm not quite sure. Uh, I can't quite remember at this moment. But anyways, it made him, he's got a disability, not only mentally, but also physically. He's got this really bad limp. And so anytime, you know, he comes down and talks to me, um, it just takes a lot of energy and a lot of effort to try to to come to my house. And he's he's a nice guy. He's a sweet guy. And I can't imagine, you know, going through something like that. Uh, His father would come and would cut the grass in the summertime and would weed eat for him. And just because he he can't really do it, he doesn't really know how to do it because he's he's got this disability. And so, oh man, it was heartbreaking. A, A few weeks ago, he comes down my back of my yard because I'm out uh, outside doing a few things and he's limping all the way and his girlfriend's with him I could tell immediately by his face he's really upset because he starts yelling out for me and I couldn't hear him at all because I had the the lawnmower going I was outside like I said doing stuff and so I I walk up the yard and immediately I could see this distress on his face and he says you know my father just passed away apparently he had this blood clot in his leg uh, that had made its way up to his heart 
and, and, and his father just suddenly died. And he said, well, my dad, really, the doctors think he died because he had a broken heart. Here his brother, who lived up the road along with his father, had passed away in a car accident, leaving behind three children. And so in the span of six months, he lost both his father and his brother. And his mother, who was left behind, who, who's, who's living in that house, I mean, she's totally devastated. And so my heart really breaks for them because here, in, in a moment's time, their life is going well. They have all of this property, all of these things. They have each other, and then it's all gone. And so I went over to her house uh, with Piper. I took Piper with me, and I knocked on the door, and we started the share series, which we're going to be kicking off uh, in March, and we're going to start tracking our share. And uh, we'll give you more information about that next week. But I handed her the Seven Christian Church card, and I just wanted to let her know, and I told her my heart breaks for her. And I can't imagine having gone through that type of tragedy and that experience in such a short amount of time. And I said, if there's anything that you need, cutting your grass, fixing something, repairing something, I want you to know that I love you and that I'm here for you. And she was very, very grateful and very, very thankful. And she said, you know, it's only my faith and my family that's been able to get me through this time of tragedy. Focusing on what you have, not on what you lost, is what carries you through. It is the great secret of being content. And so I want to challenge you that with this morning. And I want to encourage you, at this moment in your life, focus on who you are, who you have, and what you have not being distracted by what you don't. Will you stand and pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning and we're thankful for the blessing of the cross. We're thankful for your love and your grace for us. And God, I pray that everyone in this room will resolve to be content with being dependent completely and wholly upon you. God, I know that there are people in this room who are struggling with their marriage right now or maybe sitting next to the person that they've been with for many, many years and they are struggling to find a way to be thankful. But God, I pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that you will give them the ability and the strength to be happy and thankful for what they have. God, I know there are people in this room who are discontent with their jobs and their situation. I know there are students in this room who are unhappy with their singleness and their family life. God, I know that there are so many people who just have bought into the lie of gaining and wanting more and focusing on the bad. And God, I pray that we will rid ourselves of that. Father, we thank you for the cross. We glory in the cross. God, you are everything to us. And I pray that we'll always be reminded of that fact. God, I pray for the person in this room who has not yet accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, has not entrusted themselves by placing their faith in you and turning away from the life of discontent. God, I pray that you would just lavish their heart and their mind with the fact that you are enough, that they can be totally satisfied with having a relationship with you. And God, I pray that their heart would be moved in such a way to accept the gospel and be baptized in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for them. Lord, we thank you and we love you and we lift up our voices now to sing this praise to you. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.